just do the welcome. But buckle up, because you're about to hear the welcome, the sermon, the offering, and the Lord's Supper. I know that feels overwhelming, but we're going to do it together. Open up your Bible to Luke chapter 2. I just wanted to share a short uh, devotional with you, about 15 minutes, and then we're going to spend a little extra time worshiping today and we're going to do a, just a shorter service, 45, 50 minutes. Don't quote me. If it goes an hour, God has spoken, right? Uh, so God came down. You know, uh, Merry Christmas. I was talking to my friend who uh, lives in Florida. Florida's long. So he wasn't up here. He was all the way down here in South Florida. His name's Drexel. And I said, bro, uh, how, what's the temperature there? And he was like, it's 82 outside right now. And when it gets 82 here, you guys feel the, the heat is oppressive. I have found that. People are like, I can't go outside. I'm like, this is like winter in Florida. And I was like, do you know how cold it is here? And he was like, I don't know, 50? I was like, 
So naive. I was like, it feels 100 degrees colder here than where you are. And the church said, amen, right? I was, and he was like, what? Like he thought I was, it was a joke. Um, Michigan has made me hardier. It has. It's made me stronger, I like to think. Thank you guys all for being here. For those joining online, we're so grateful you're here as well. Uh, welcome to church. We're glad you're here. Um, my friends in Florida think that we're all lunatics for living up here. And you know what? Maybe we are a little crazy. But I still like, like it. Like It's weird. Like Maybe it's because it's novel. Some of you guys are like, just be here for 50 years like me. And maybe so, but I still like it. You know, perception and perspective are a big deal in life. My perspective on what's hot and cold has changed a great deal since I moved here. Uh, my friend's perspective on what I think is hot and cold has changed a lot. And we're going to talk a little bit about perception today and how it influences the way we think about life in relation to God becoming a man. That was a weird statement. Stick with me. By the end, you'll understand what I'm talking about. How friends perceive you determine the way they treat you, right? So uh, maybe you're in high school or you're almost in high school or you look at back in high school, but middle school and high school are like tough years. Like when you ask someone, oh, how old are your kids? And they're like, middle school. You're like, it's tough. That's tough. Because a lot of it's just so much of your life is about how other people see me, right? How you're perceived. And if, if people think you're cool or fun or popular, people tr one person will treat you very differently than if you weren't those things, right? It's, Nick was, well, you were the most popular person in school, right? I mean, sure, surely. No, you married the most popular person in school. <laughs> so, how someone would treat Nick, maybe. Were you a cool guy? So it's hard when you ask somebody that question, right? You're like, I don't know if they have a good self-awareness. Nick has high self-awareness. He's in the middle. So most people would treat Nick like in the middle. Like if it's appropriate to make fun of him, they'll do so. If it's appropriate to think he's the cool guy and worship him, they'll do that. That's how high school is, right? It's very fickle. It's very much how people perceive you. That's your experience. And how your friends think about you determines how they treat you. In parenting, what, what your kids think about you will determine not just how they treat you, it will determine how they view the whole world and how they view other people. I remember this story my dad told me. My older sister is by far the most rebellious child of us three. And thank God for it because she paved, I, I watched her disciplined a lot and I feel like I just rode in her wake. You know, I just like, I was like, all right, I won't do any of that. And I was fine. And I remember it started when she was like 11 months, early, early rebelliousness. My dad was teaching her that, did you guys know that many houseplants are poisonous? It's very odd. Yeah, yeah, like poinsettias are poisonous. Not like you'll die immediately, obviously. But they're poisonous. And my dad, my mom had put a, 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 like a flower arrangement with poisonous plants, and they're not intentionally, not like Venus flytraps, like, you know, but like, like poisonous. And my dad was trying to teach my older sister a lesson, an object lesson. He said, Sweetie, you're not allowed to, you can touch anything else in this room. It was like Adam and Eve. You can go anywhere, but do not touch this. She looked right at him while staring him in the eyes, grabbed it, and grabbed it. You're not just like, boom. She was like, what are you going to do? It's the first time she ever got a little, a little slap. And she looked at him like, you betrayed me. Like, how could you hit, how could you lay hands on me, you know? And he's like, don't touch that. That was the beginning of, Jennifer's formation and how to treat and act around my dad. The way we train our kids has a, a lot to do with how they're going to treat the rest of the world and think about life, right? My kid, your kids will test you. They're going to test your limits. They're going to they're push you. And how you treat those moments teaches them how to interact with the rest of the world, often with grace and love, but also with discipline, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. What your friends think about you mattered in high school, in middle school, still matters now. What your kids, how your kids perceive you matters a great deal, but what you think about God is the most important thing about you. The way you think about God affects everything else in your life. Everything. It impacts the way you make decisions. It changes the way you perceive hardship, especially. It shapes your attitude, your character, transforms how you think about your career, your finances, your personal choices. If I believe God doesn't like me, 
and that he's fundamentally out to get me, then hardship is personal. It's punitive. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, you're going you're gonna to ingest that as a, a, discipline, a disciplinary measure that God brought against you, a punishment for your misdoing. So, you know, whatever, you get fired, or you, there's a slump at work, or you fail in a class, or you know, whatever, you, a relationship ends, you think, oh, God's mad at me, right? That's sort of the lens through which you think. And that changes everything about. My response, then, to discipline and hardship is anger and bitterness, rather than trust and growth, right? If I believe is God is good, but has limited power, I like God, kind of like he's a cool dude, right? Like, I, I like him. Maybe I have a casual relationship with him. You know when people pray, and they're like, hey, bro, like, thanks for, like, your friendship. And you're like, are you talking to me right now? Like, is that, are you talking to God? How do you think about God? We need to have a friendship with God, but there's also a reverence, right? But if we think he's limited in power, it's going to uh, show in our prayer lives, in our, and we're, we will be good people, but we won't be faithful people. We won't believe that God is going to or can do anything. We become self-reliant then, right? When you ask someone that are going through something hard, have you prayed? And they say, oh, I haven't thought about that. Where does that come from? That's, self, that's a self-reliance, right? Like, and that, and that, that digs deeper into what do you think about God? Because if God is good and he's all-powerful, changes the way I think about life. It changes everything about my life. I then can face hardship, criticism, because God's working through that pain. Kristen and I just had our third child three months ago, almost three months ago. I'm going to tell you, it's been the hardest three months of my life. And I feel like I've had some hard months in my life. Some of you have had way harder lives than me, and so this wouldn't qualify as your hardest months. But, you know, after our first two were born, people were always like, are you going to have a third and I was like, oh, I don't know. It's such an exciting conversation. After my third, do you want a fourth? It's not a fun conversation where I'm like, I can't even imagine having another child. <laughs> like, I feel like Noel, Noel is her name. She has completed our family. Our family is complete, and it is done. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be said, God can do what he wants, but it's Lord hear me. Like, I think we're done. And it's been a lot. She's had a lot of compounding factors, right? So She's colic. And, and just the things I'm about to share are not like a, a pity party. There are people in here that have been through so, like, she's healthy. And honestly, as a parent, when people are like, what am I praying for your kid that's not born? You're like, just that they're healthy. Like, it's the only thing I care about. And so I feel so grateful. I'm not, I'm not complaining, but this is just the reality, right? She's colic. So for the first two and a half months, if she was awake, she was crying, basically. And I don't know if you've been around a, a crying baby for more than an hour or two or a thousand but it starts to wear you down. It wears you down. I felt really worn down. And it's gotten better in the last couple of weeks. But compounded with her colic, well, she has a high palate. And so what a high palate means is that she won't take a pacifier. Now, some of you out there are like, my child has never touched a passy. That's not me. I'm happy for my child that passy is long until they're three. Three was the cutoff point. I don't want you to be 15 with a pacifier. Like, there's a limit somewhere but I was totally cool with it. And the pacifier, like, saved us for our first two children. Noelle will not take one. And not only will she not take it, 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 it produces her gag reflex, and so she often throws up when we give it to her. She also won't take a bottle, which means that she's exclusively breastfed, which is what Kristen wanted, but she also likes when I can give her a bottle to give her a break. So she, like, doesn't have that. It's, and then she doesn't sleep. Like, it's not normal for us to get no more than an hour straight at night for weeks. I mean, Kristen's like a hero. Like, if you see her and she's not asleep, you're like, you're a hero. Like, and she, and you wouldn't know she was tired because you would know I'm tired. People are like, you look exhausted. I'm like, thanks. I really appreciate that. It's so encouraging. Is it my droopy eyes? Like, what is it that you're seeing? Um, I do often look tired. My, and we just found out she has hip dysplasia, which is like not the super serious thing, but it means that she has to be in this super weird, like, baby body cast, which is very awkward for like three months. And then we found out today that she is femoral um, something. Femoral something. Is that clear? Is that scientific enough for you? Um, which basically means she's pinched a nerve, uh, which means that we have to take it off now or else she won't be able to use that leg, let it recover, and then put it back on and sort of lose the progress. So it's like, it feels like a lot. It's like everything happened with you. Like, our other kids were like super healthy, and then Noel was like, I want it all, you know? And honestly, like, in hindsight, I have friends that have lost children. I have friends that have had kids that are in the hospital for months. Like, I don't feel like this is the hardest thing you could ever go through. But I'm going to tell you something. 
it has tested me. I mean, I've had nights I've been awake at 4 a.m., and I'm just like, Jesus, baby Jesus, help me. Like, it's like, it's like you pray to God, and then when you're desperate, it's like, baby Jesus. You're, like, you're just like, it gets hard. Like, where I just feel desperate. The way I've processed that, that would have made me very bitter if I didn't know God loved me, right? If I didn't know God was doing it, I would have been so embittered by now, so angry. It would have really hurt my marriage by this point. It hasn't. It's actually helped. Our, we've grown closer, right? Through just, there's nothing about growing closer than just waking up together at 3 a.m. with a screaming child. You're like, this is, I'm so sad, but, like, I'm so exhausted, but we're exhausted together, right? There's bonding. And so, like, but so, because of the way I think about God, it shapes my perception about all those things. Are you with me, right? So you've had those things in your life. How do you view God? Luke 2, I didn't forget. Uh, Luke 2, verse 8. This story, I want to tell you a story that you have almost certainly heard that should shape your perception about God. A truth that should shape the way you think God, which should shape the way you live. Verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That's for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, this is the key part of the verse. A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, about which the Lord has told us about. I'm going to have to fix that later. Actually, Chad, could you fix it for me now? Hugs. I'll give you hugs. I'll need it for the last song. Thanks, bro. What does this story teach you about God? How does it affect you? That God came to earth as a human baby to experience all your joy, your sorrow, your pain, your confusion, your fun, your laughter. Where do you think laughter comes from? God. Your longing, your temptation. And how did God come into the world? Not just as a, as a baby, but with what fanfare, right? Fanfare is like celebratory praise. A host of angels, an army of angels, filled the sky over Bethlehem. And just started singing. Now, what's amazing to me about this is, one, there's something that we can learn about worship, and I'll, and I'll tag that on at the end to help our singing later. But it's not just what we learn about worship, but what we learn about the character of God by whom the angels are performing before. Who sees these angels? It's not the Roman emperor, not King Herod or the Sanhedrin. It's some, like, poor shepherds in the field. I don't know how many, a handful, 30, 20. Like, why, why, why perform before them? A performance is only great when people hear it. Right? Have you ever done something and just be like, please, just people come? <laughs> like, you know, just I don't care. I just let there be at least 20 people there. So I think that before every church service. Ann Arbor's awesome, and our attendance has been great, but it's just like a thing in my mind. I'm like, man, I hope there's at least three people here, you know? all this work into it, you know? Like, you just want that. And, and Jesus, God sends these angels to nobody. What does that tell you about he doesn't care what people think? And he doesn't, he doesn't care about an audience? He doesn't care about so many of the things that I care about? Despite his grandeur, his transcendent power, the, the glory due to him that we owe him, his infinite nature, his eternal existence, God Almighty somehow possesses a quality so rare in humanity that it's hard to imagine it in God, and that's humility. How can God be humble? How is this a thing? How, how, is, how could Philippians 2 be true, right? Where it says Jesus cons didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Humility may be the rarest human quality. Not insecurity, 
or a lack of confidence, but a genuine belief that you shouldn't be treated better than others. This actually doesn't make sense logically to me in terms of God, and yet there it is. Book ended in his life from beginning to end. God has his son born to a poor family, raised in, as a foreigner in Egypt, further raised in a backwater town of Nazareth, serves a humble occupation for at least a decade, becomes a poor traveling Jewish rabbi supported by other people with no home and dies a criminal. That's wild. That is wild. And, and what it, one of the things that we love is we love, we love our celebrities and we love the idea of celebrities being down to earth. Like we love the stories about like, and then Brad Pitt said, what's up to me? And he was so chill. Like, and it was like everything I wanted. I don't know why I talk like that. Like I've never heard a new story like that. Whatever, like I've even like fantasized before about like running into someone on the plane and they just, just be like, what's up, bro? And like I know who you are, but I don't care. You know, like we're just chill. Like that's never happened to me. I would never see famous people. And when I do, I'm like, wow, famous person. And they're gone. I'm like, oh, it wasn't cool. And we, we like the idea of celebrities, this idea that they're like normal people, right? That they haven't been corrupted by their power they're not so greedy or so high and mighty or too big for their britches that they can't interact with like normal people. And, and then you have God who in Psalm 18 says he stooped down to make you great. Like the greatest celebrity. It's like our friend. Like he just became a baby and did all the things that babies do and was completely at the mercy of his parents, his friends, he was an adolescent. He was a teenager. He was an awkward middle schooler. I don't, I don't think call it middle school then, but you know what I'm saying? Like, he was at the awkward age. He was at the non-awkward age. He was, had work problems. He had people that abused him at work. And all this, he just, God became a man. It tells you something about God. It tells you that he's a God you can follow. Because there's no one I'd rather follow than someone with infinite power, infinite goodness, and who was also humble. It's a shocking combination of qualities you have to let this story about god becoming a baby shape the way you think about god and bring you to a place of wonder and reverence right just like wow and when we sing today which we're going to spend the next 25 minutes doing when you're you're singing to that god you have to remember that right these songs we sing we're going to sing them in a less familiar way but they're familiar songs you've you've heard them before it's it can be so automatic right just don't let it be. Think about the words. Right? Hark the herald angels sing, right? The, the angels are singing about him. And if, and if the angels can worship, the very least we can do is imitate that example and worship ourselves. I really do think that the way you sing is an indicator about the depth of your relationship with God. And I, I, when, I've, when I've heard the criticism before of, oh, I don't really like connect with that kind of worship, I'm not saying this is always true. I believe it's often an indication of a shallow understanding of both worship and God. Now, I think we can all agree that some worship is better than others, right? I know because I've offered horrific worship to churches and good stuff. The, the goal is for it always to be good. But I want to encourage you to get to a place today where you can really worship. Right? Whatever that means, you're closing your eyes, you're lifting your hands. You don't even have to sing be singing in your heart, right? Hear the words. And if you're like, oh, I don't know this version, learn it and sing it right away. That's what we're going to do the rest of the time, okay? Let's take a moment. I'm going to have the worship team come on up. We're going to say a prayer uh, for both the offering and the Lord's Supper. As far as the offering goes, as you know, you can give online or in the black box in the back. For communion, I believe you should all have one. If you don't have one, you can raise your hand uh, right after we get done praying, and one will be brought to you. Take communion from between now and the end of service. We're just going to sing. Take it while you sing. Take it while you think. If you want to take a second, stop singing and sit down. Do that. We're going to go ahead and flip the lights down now, some of them, and we're just going to have some time of worship. Sound good? Let's take just a moment of silence, and then we'll pray, and then we'll have a great service together. Father God, we love you, and we are so grateful that you came here, 
And you loved us enough to become a human, to empathize, to connect, and to save us from our sins. Help us now as we worship you to do so with reverence as you deserve. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll be standing the whole time unless at any point you want to sit, then you can do so. What child is this who lays to rest on Mary's back is sleeping? Who made just breathe? we read in Luke 2 that the angels sang
must really be like. That if someone were to truly see your glory, they would die on the spot. God, it's hard to imagine a legion of angels and heavenly hosts singing just about your arrival as a small child. But God, we, we want to stand before you at this time, at this moment together, God, to do our best to worship you, to do our best to honor you. God, I pray that you would seep into our hearts and our minds an understanding about who you are so that we could worship you appropriately. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God in sin is reconciling
people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah 9, 2, and continuing in verse 6 and 7. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatest of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, and the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore.
you alone. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. Christ alone. Yeah, sing this. Oh, you got here. We go. to worship together. Obviously, there's a time for a kind of worship that is deeply reverent, and then there's a time to party. That is just the way God works, I'm telling you. It's like heaven's not always like that. Sometimes it's like we just experienced, and sometimes it's just a party. Should we turn the lights on for the parties as Christians, right? So let's turn the lights on now, and let's party. This is our last song, and then we'll let you go. Dancing is encouraged. Feliz Navidad. Merry Christmas. 
Christmas.